So welcome everyone to the NERSC data science uh, seminar series. Um, we're really excited today to have one of our colleagues from uh, CRD to share with us um, a talk. So uh, on uh, memory disaggregation, the potentials and pitfalls. Um, Nan is a research scientist in the performance and algorithms group of CRD at LBL. Her research interests include high performance computing, performance modeling, and auto tuning. Nan received her PhD in computer science from Tsinghua University in China in 2018. And we're very excited to hear about a, a hot topic on memory disaggregation um, that many of us are contemplating uh, and trying to get our heads you know, heads around. So with that, I'm gonna give you the floor, Dan. Oh, you gotta unmute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so um, I think I'm going to turn off my video so that we, I won't be cut off by no network. Um, okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the potentials and pitfalls of the memory disaggregation. Um, so the outline for today, I, I want to uh, have an introduction about what is memory disaggregation. And then we go through some need to knows for designing a disaggregated memory system. And then um, we can explore the design space and their implications. So um, first, um, I mean, let's go through uh, today and today's um, node architecture and memory disaggregation. So we all know that compute nodes are the basic unit of today's HPC system. So you see compute node and memory resources are tightly coupled in each node and users request the resources in a unit of a node. So conversely, memory disaggregation um, aims to decouple the compute and memory resources. As such, you will have um, a memory pool which has many memory only nodes, and these memory nodes are shared across the compute node. So such disaggregation um, allows for independent allocations of these resources, regardless of where a job is placed. In other words, applications could use all the memory available across an entire data center instead of uh, being confined to the memory of a single server. Uh, so the reason that we want to explore the disaggregated memory is because um, we see it's a common that in today's data center, um, memory pressure varies greatly among jobs. For example, at NERSC, um, half the workload does not experience significant memory pressure, but 15% uh, of the workloads use over 75% of the available memory per node. So, um, when planning for the next machine, we do not want to over-provision every node with the maximum requirement because it's a waste of resource, but also um, costly. So today's solution is to equip uh, with some large memory node. So the main issue here is that such solution is lack of flexibility. Uh, you can think that how do you foresee what kind of workload is gonna run, I mean, a nurse in the future. And what if the memory um, you provide today is not enough or, I mean, too many? So therefore, uh, memory disaggregation uh, is one way to go. And uh, there's also many research papers that recently published in recent three years uh, in resource uh, disaggregation. It all shows that uh, memory dis uh, disaggregation can address memory imbalance and improve memory utilization in data center and, and of course uh, of course cloud. Um, but we still have challenges. So if you see this figure, it shows the ratio of growing flows and memory uh, bandwidth and memory uh, bandwidth and latency and also the ratio of growing flows uh, and network bandwidth and latency over time. So you can immediately observe that we have bountiful flows, but lagging bandwidth and latency. So actually the issue just, uh, I mean, arise from here. I mean, if everything improves at the same time, then nothing really change. But this resource tells us the processor will be increasingly imbalanced with respect to data motion. So if we building a, 
if we build a disaggregated memory system, it is likely to be of an increasing concern. Also a challenge that the overall uh, memory utilization on the system improves, but individual jobs performance may degrade with increased memory access over the network. Uh, the good thing that we still have opportunities because there's many emerging technologies come up like Compute Express Link, like DDR5, which provide much higher bandwidth and much higher capacity. Uh, so let's give a quick look about what we have today and going to have in the future. And then we can, I mean, better reason the performance of a disaggregated memory system. So at today's system, let's say parameter, we have a HBM2 and DDR4, and each node would connect with PCIe4 NIC. And then uh, in the year 2024 frame, we're gonna have HBM3, uh, but also DDR4. But here DDR4, I would assume it uh, it built with 16 dimes. So it has a larger um, capacity and higher bandwidth than what we have today on Prometer. And in year 2026, we're gonna have HBM3 and DDR5 and also PCIe6 NIC. But uh, I mean, Eventually, the PCIe NIC, you see the bandwidth is much lower than DDR4 and HBM and HBM memory. So the network would be the bottleneck. So I'm going to play with these uh, emerging technologies to reason the benefit or um, pitfalls of using a memory pool. So before we really talk the details about this system architecture design, let's go through some need to knows. First is Leto's law. Um, it is a very useful rule because it provides a simple way to measure the effect of a system. So let me give you a simple uh, escalators example. Uh, let's say the parameters here are uh, if we have one person per step on this escalator and uh, a step arrives every two seconds, and that gives a bandwidth of 0.5 person per second. If this escalator is 20 steps tall, uh, that gives the latency about uh, 40, 40 seconds. So uh, if, we, if we have one person in flight, that means that the achieved bandwidth of this escalator is about one over 40 person per second. And then if we want to uh, saturate the escalator's bandwidth, we're gonna need one person arriving every two seconds. And that means we will need 20 people in flight. So you see the beauty of this Leto's law is that it's tri-directional. So given any two of these parameters, I mean, it's either latency or bandwidth or throughput, we can calculate the third. So the takeaway idea of this Leto's law um, is that it takes latency time unit for the first person to arrive. And we need bandwidth persons to get on the escalator every time unit. So the same idea applies to the system architecture. High level speaking, bandwidth gives you performance while latency is a constant overhead you pay, but it can be hidden. So that's revisit the system architecture uh, figures. So Prometer, uh, Prometer node is a fairly standard node structure. It has one CPU that uh, connected to all four GPUs and a node local DDR, and then a all flash lustre file system. But by memory disaggregation, uh, the node local DDR will be separate from the node resource and be a remote memory node. So each compute node here, I'm assuming uh, we're gonna use an APU, which combines a CPU and a GPU on a single silicon die. And the both CPU and GPU share a common bus to a, a common path to the remote memory. So um, compute nodes need to go over the network, uh, go over the network for the remote memory access. So it is natural that in you know, a disaggregated system, you can access much more <laughs> DDR memory than today. But now the question is, um, how do you 
want to build such a memory node? And could you get benefit from memory disaggregation? So this related to my next three topics. Uh, the first I'm, I'm going to talk about the system design is that how many compute node and how many memory nodes you want to buy. And then um, based on this system architecture design, I will talk about uh, how applications gonna, um, gonna be benefit and what's the performance penalty of those workloads. And then in the end, I will talk about a implementation of this uh, memory pool. So let's go through the first topic is the system design. The fundamental question here is that if you have 10K compute node, how many memory, how many memory nodes do you want to buy? So here we still assuming that one compute node uh, is one APU and uh, equipped with one NIC and one memory node here, let's assume is a DDR5 memory, which gives you four terabytes per memory node capacity and also equipped with one, uh, one PCIe NIC. So um, let's start from, us, from a simple case. Uh, if you compute node and memory node, I mean, are in one-to-one -one ratio, that means by average, each compute node can access one memory node's um, capacity uh, and then utilize all the NIC bandwidth for remote memory. Another case is that if you are in two-to-one ratio, that means you have every two compute nodes that access one memory nodes. So by average, each compute node can access 50% of one memory node capacity and utilize 50% of uh, remote memory bandwidth. So you're gonna have another 50% of bandwidth unused. So the same thing applies to one to two ratio. Uh, that means one compute node can access two memory nodes by average. So per compute node, you will have 200% of memory node capacity and use all the uh, available bandwidth for this remote memory. Uh, now, um, based on these method, let's put in some real numbers. So the real numbers that are, you have 10K compute node, and then we can vary the memory node from 5K, 10K to 20K, which corresponds to this two to one, one to one, and one to two uh, ratio case, this three cases with a total remote memory capacity vary from 20 pegabytes to 40 and then to 80. So we can see this, um, let's see this figure first. So this figure, the horizontal is the uh, number of compute node and the number of uh, memory nodes. If all the compute nodes that are requiring remote memory, this corresponds to the three cases we just talked about and the memory capacity each node can get is like two terabyte, which is 50% uh, of the node memory capacity uh, and four terabyte and eight terabyte. Um, so as we go from left to right, we are reducing the memory contention. So similarly, if we reduce the percentage of compute node that requiring remote memory, let's say only 50% of nodes that are requiring remote memory, um, each node, uh, the, the memory capacity each compute node can get, it then doubled. And then let's say if only 1% of compute node are requiring remote memory, the memory capacity each compute node can get is hundredfold. So as we go down this heat map, we are again reducing the contention. So this is for the memory capacity. We can then use the same method to have another heat map plot for the net, uh, for the PCIe NIC bandwidth we can achieve. So again, um, this is reference to the three cases we just talked about. And here, let me use PCIe 5 NIC as an example. So if all the compute nodes are requiring remote memory, each compute node can get um, half peak um, half a uh, NIC bandwidth in two to one ratio case, and then reach the peak uh, in one to one and uh, one to two ratio case. 
Similarly, if the percentage of compute node that are requiring remote memory decreases, we are then reducing the contention and thus each compute node can get higher bandwidth until it reached the peak. So following this method, we can have uh, uh, a bigger heat map that's described the available remote memory capacity and available remote memory bandwidth with PCIe 5 and PC, PCIe 5 NIC and PCIe 6 NIC. So for example, um, uh, but I mean, not all of them are reasonable when we consider how we're gonna configure the system in the future. So for example, if we think it in the year 2025 frame, HBM3 could uh, give us uh, 512 gigabytes capacity. So you don't want to buy a compute node that whose remote memory is smaller than the local memory. So, that, so all the blocks that are in this uh, upper left region actually are not, maybe not a good choice. We then need to see uh, where future NERSC apps gonna land to decide which configuration makes more sense in the rest of the heat map. But if you recall uh, at today's uh, NERSC, 50% workload use 70% memory per node. So that means, um, let's give a sense that maybe all the highlighted area would be a more tractable design space. That's about 10% to 20% compute node that are requiring remote memory. Uh, so next I'm gonna to, um, sh to give a showcase that if we do a storage replacements for AI training, then how much benefit we can get. So here I'm using a Cosmo Flow um, training uh, benchmark uh, to, 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 to do the showcase. So Cosmo Flow is a scientific machine learning benchmark in uh, I'm our Perf HPC training benchmark suit. It uses a 3D convolutional neural network with five convolutional layer and three fully connected layers. Uh, so all the data here I use refers to uh, PN uh, refers to the PS uh, PMBS paper listed here. But uh, but you know the data that matters is that for Cosmo for this Cosmo Flow ca uh, case. We need the training set is about five terabytes and the flows per sample bed is about 15K. So let's see how, how this cost from flow case can get, can be benefited from a disaggregated uh, system. So first we need to, uh, I mean, to pick up a system configuration. So uh, again, if you recall that uh, the 10 to 20% is a more attractable uh, system configuration based on what NERSC happened today. So again, if we, pick, if we pick another system architecture, let's say we have 10K compute node and equipped with 1K memory node with further narrow down our system configuration to, to, the, to the blocks here. I mean, the overlapped uh, highlighted blocks. So it gives the four terabyte memory capacity per compute node. And correspondingly, you can reach the NIC peak. If it's PCIe 5, you're gonna reach 50% gigabytes. If it's PCIe 6 NIC, you can reach 100% gigabytes. So in the Cosmo flow here, in the Cosmo flow case, so today you can either do it, I mean, in a Lustre file system, you, you, you just read, load all the data from Lustre and this gives you coherence, but you have no performance. Alternatively, you can also distribute all your data in your local SSD. It gives you better performance, but you, you don't have coherent. You still have to pay expensive data synchronization. So in a disaggregated memory system, let's say we pay, uh, again, we pay a 10K compute node and only 10% compute nodes that are requiring remote memory. Um, Let's see how, how much better we can get. So in the Cosmo plot case, if you recall, we have 
five terabytes training set, and we need 15K flops per sample bed. So again, if we fit in this disaggregated memory system, we can in this, in the in the picked up uh, system architecture, we can definitely reach the network peak. So that tells us with a peak PCIe 5 NIC, we're gonna require uh, 770 teraflops compute capability to finish this Cosmo flow work. So if it's PCIe 6, we're going to need more. But I'm going to give you a reference about how, how much compute capability we can provide at today's and future GPU. For example, on A100 GPU, it can provide uh, 218 teraflops by uh, FP16 tensor, which is required by the Cosmo flow. Uh, this, this number actually is much lower than what we're gonna require by using PCIe 5 NIC. So if it's Hopper GPU, Hopper GPU is a newly announced GPU uh, this year by NVIDIA. Uh, it can provide 1700 uh, teraflops, which is also slightly lower than what we're gonna require by PCIe 5 NIC and also much lower by PCIe 6 NIC. So you can see that by using a disaggregated memory system, it shifts the bottleneck from I.O. to compute, which is good because if you recall the figure that I show at the beginning of this talk, flows always grows much faster than bandwidth and latency. Uh, so this is the first case that uh, we see how AI training workload can be benefit from uh, memory disaggregation. Um, but I mean, we have, we of course have various kind of applications. So next I'm gonna talk about what kind of application would be benefit and what will be the performance bottleneck and performance penalty. So again, let's look at this memory capacity and the bandwidth figure. So this is what we have today. We have HBM2 as local memory, and we have PCIe4 NIC. And then in year 2024, we're gonna have HBM3 and PCIe5 NIC. And in year 2026, it's still HBM3 and PCIe6 NIC. You see there's a big gap between the local memory and uh, and network bandwidth. So again, the network bandwidth will definitely be your bottleneck. So the general question is that, how will memory disaggregation change our way to handle data? And do you have a chance to operate at HBM speed and will not be bounded by the PCIe NIC? So here I'm using a memory roofline to present this uh, capability. So let's do a visit of the traditional roofline. Well, the traditional flow roofline tells you which takes longer. It's either data movement or compute. So if you dot four into, four into the left part of this wall, that means you're gonna be memory bound and data movement takes longer. If you if you dot fall into the right of this dotted wall, that means you compute your compute bound and your compute takes longer. So memory roofline, um, I mean, take the similar plot, but it shows a very different insight. It might not have tells you whether it's your local memory takes longer or remote memory takes longer. So in this plot. So the horizontal is a local remote memory ratio and the vertical is a tenable uh, gigabytes per second. So correspondingly, your peak is not flows, but your peak is a local memory bandwidth. So if you plot, if, if you have a dot that fall into this dotted wall to the left of this dotted wall, that means you will be bound by the remote memory and you, you remote that, uh, so in other words, as your remote memory takes longer. So if you dot fall into the right of this dotted wall, that means your local memory bond and local memory takes longer. So let's see how, where we can get. This is a plot uh, that reflects what we have today. So today we have PCIe 4 NIC and HBM2. That means we're gonna have to refer HBM memory 60, 
uh, two times than PCIe4 NIC, and then we can operate at, at HBM2 speed. Otherwise, you're gonna fall into the lap of this dotted wall, which means your remote memory bound and you will eventually buy bound by the PCIe NIC. So in year 2024, when we have PCIe 5 NIC and HBM3, you're gonna refer more data from HBM memory so that you can operate at, at HBM3 op, uh, speed. In year 2026, since we have a much faster NIC, it pushes the dotted wall to the left. You can refer, I mean, the same number, roughly the same number uh, as today is about 65 HBM memory than the PCIe NIC, then you can operate at HBM3. So the main takeaway from this figure is that if you have a faster NIC, that will push the dotted wall to the left and you will spare less effort to refer the local memory and to, to overcome the uh, NIC bandwidth. So let's see how applications goes from here. So this is a um, so this is um, this is plot. In this plot, the horizontal is the memory capacity, and the vertical is the local remote memory ratio. So if you recall, in the year 2026 frame, HBM3 would give you uh, 512 gigabytes uh, capacity. So anything uh, that be would be smaller than uh, 512 gigabytes would fit in the HBM in year 2026. And, and then for the, for the orange zone that refers, you can be benefit from memory disaggregation because you have a higher local remote memory ratio. So you will operate at, at HBM speed. So alternatively, if you fall into this green zone, which means you have large capacity, but you have low local remote memory ratio, say smaller than 65, and you will, that means you will, you will be bound by PCIe NIC. So here it just gave you a reference about how, uh, how much we have at today's parameter node. So you'll see HBM3 in year 2026 will give you much more capacity than today's parameter no, local DDR. So let's see, let's see the first, let's see the AI training. Uh, so you can think in an AI training workloads, um, local memory refers as your activation layer and remote memory refers to your uh, sample mini bench. So we just show the Cosmo flow, but also the deep cam and both uh, Cosmo flow both fall into the orange region because you have large capacity, which cannot fit in HBM. You also have a, high local uh, remote memory visual. Uh, but uh, if I think another case is ResNet, which has a relatively low memory requirement. So in the future, you are likely to fit all your model into the HBM memory. But I mean, you could also have some other uh, special training model, which have a very sparse activation layer, that means you will fall into this green zone because you have a low local remote memory ratio. But generally speaking, model size, AI training model size grows um, expandingly. So at the average, all AI model increase 25 uh, times every two year and training size only get bigger. So, which, so in general, it moves by AI training workload is moved to the upper right and into the orange zone. So that means memory disaggregation could benefit, in general, benefit AI training workload. But we also have many other workloads, for example, the graph analysis apps. Uh, you can think if you have a small graph, uh, you are likely to fit in HBM, and then actually you, you wouldn't care this disaggregated memory system. But uh, if you have a large graph, um, because it's by natural such graph analysis um, application would have a low local remote memory ratio. So you're gonna eventually be limited by the PCIe NIC. And then uh, for the HPC applications, I would say it may touch all three zones, but depending on the memory patterns. So you see, uh, we do have many applications that could be benefit uh, in, in, this, in such a dis, uh, memory disaggregate 
uh, uh, in such a disaggregated memory system. So now the next question is that if we see the benefit and how would you build, how would you implement such a um, memory, memory pool? So here that's uh, re reveal the Little's law. So the, the Little's law tells you that it takes latency times unit for the first person to arrive and we need bandwidth persons to get on the escalator every unit. So remember that to, to maximum the escalator's bandwidth, we're gonna need 20 people, which equals to the latency multiplied by the bandwidth in flight so that we can maximum the escalator's bandwidth. So the similar thing applies to the system architecture. So here we are gonna use this Little's law to calculate how many data you need to keep in flight uh, so that you can hide network latency. And do you have enough parallelism? Do you have enough concurrency to hide, to support uh, such number of data to be in flight? So let's consider uh, in a network attached to um, this aggregated memory system, we consider the network latency is about two microseconds. So in PCIe 5 NIC, we're gonna have 0 0.12 megabytes data in flight to high latency. And in PCIe 6 NIC, we're gonna have, we're gonna double this data. So let's see how, let's see if we have enough uh, parallelism or concurrency to high latency. Uh, again, here we're gonna use a concurrency loop plan to, to tell you that can you hide PCIe NIC latency. Uh, let's uh, revisit this flop roof line again. So the flop roof line tells which takes longer, it's either the data movement or the compute. But the concurrency roof line tells you whether you can hide uh, NIC latency. So in this plot, it still looks very similar with the traditional, uh, traditional roof line, but tells a very different insight. So in this figure, the vertical is a sustained gigabytes per second, and the um, horizontal is, you can think it as a parallelism. So you can think it as a hardware thread, number of hardware threads that could be, could be scheduled in flight. And then correspondingly, your uh, seedings here is a picnic bandwidth and the, the diagonal, the diagonal, the diagonal blue line is the number of bytes you need to keep in flight per thread. So if you fall into the left of this dotted law, uh, dotted law, that means that that means for this kind of solution, it's hard to hide PCIe latency. You can you cannot reach the uh, PCIe NIC bandwidth. But if you are fall into if you fall into the right of this dotted wall, that means yes, by using this solution, it's easy to hide latency. So that's Let's take a look uh, at the two solutions here. So here uh, I want to talk about two solutions. It's either the hardware solution and software solution. So by hardware solution, uh, that means uh, we can leverage the hardware threads for data movement. And each thread will handle one cache line, which is uh, 32 byte. And by software solution, that means it's performance by the OS paging. We can vary the page size from 4K to one megabyte to four to two megabytes. So let's see how it works. Let's see the hardware solution first. So because hardware solution is leverage the hardware threads to do the data motion. So um, the number of uh, load store cores in a GPU or say an APU um, determines how far we can go. So let's reveal how many load and store cores in the A100 GPU and the, the latest, the, the newly announced Hopper GPU. So on A100 GPU, you will have 4,000 load store cores. That means uh, you, can, you can schedule 4,000 threads to, for, for those 4,000 cores to keep data in flight. And on Hopper GPU, you have 4.5K threads to operate on those cores. So if you see this figure here, each thread could access one cache, one cache line, which is 32 byte. Even though you keep all the load store cores busy, you schedule all threads to keep the load, load store core busy, you can, you can barely reach the PCIe 5 um, peak, but you can never reach PCIe 6 NIC. So 
generally speaking, pure hardware solution cannot meet the requirement in year 2025 frame. But alternatively, you can use a OS paging, which is a software solution. Uh, all the purple lines here refers to the OS solution and different uh, diagonal lines here refers to different page size. Uh, so uh, apparently page size 4K cannot uh, work, but if you have one megabyte or two megabyte page size, you see here, uh, you can easily utilize the uh, PCIe 6 bandwidth and high latency. So um, from this analysis, we can see OS solution can easily saturate NIC bandwidth with page size larger than 256 kilobyte. So OS paging would be a more tractable solution for the um, disaggregated memory system. Uh, so, and another, in the end, I want to talk about by implementing such a a uh, disaggregated memory system, how would that affect uh, programmers? So how do you program on this uh, disaggregated system? So you can think that by either hardware solution or software solution, you can we can provide implicit interface or explicit interface. So implicit, uh, implicit interface, which means that um, it's programmer friendly. You can think you just a program like unified memory, but it's generally expensive. Uh, alternatively, you can, we can also use implicit interface in a software solution, which means you can, uh, you can think you could prob program on this memory pool using like CUDA map copy, uh, which is cheap also, but also uh, program friendly. So alternatively, all the explicit interface, for example, like SHMAM is program unfriendly because you have to rewrite your code using, let's say, uh, SHMAM model to keep your performance and also makes, and also you, you have, you need to spare more efforts to make your code run correctly. Um, but generally speaking, software solution is relatively cheap than hardware solution. So in the end, uh, just as a con uh, summary of, uh, of my talk is that system architecture design needs to be de um, determined by both data center and applications. Uh, remember in this heat map, data centers have the budget to determine how many memory nodes you want to buy, but uh, applications running at that data center determines, determines the occupancy. So it requires both, uh, uh, both rows to determine which system architecture configuration would be more reasonable. And then we estimate the benefit or say no benefits um, of different kinds of applications. Let's say we should look at local remote memory ratio and uh, memory capacity requirement instead of using applic uh, applicable uh, scenarios because local remote memory ratio really determines whether you will be uh, bonded by the NIC bandwidth or NIC latency. And that gives you a more precise uh, performance panel penalty for your applications. And at the end, we talk about the two uh, solutions of uh, disaggregated memory system. Um, the conclusion is that the OS paging is a more tractable implementation for the memory pool compared to using hardware slide. But um, we still have some future work that need to be done. For example, uh, currently this is all uh, theoretically analysis of whether we could be benefit or uh, not benefit by the memory system. We could look uh, also look for some other uh, solutions like hardware simulation using FireSim. And we also need to evaluate uh, various applications that to see if there's more critical matrix uh, need to be considered. We also, uh, since this memory disaggregate is, this disaggregated memory system is actually an all stacks question. So we need to collaborate with all other stacks to see um, what is missing or what, uh, what, what would be the potential. Uh, so that is all for my talk.